All right, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I'd like to thank the, uh, Mike and the two keynotes for providing such a, uh, an excellent setup for the topic that uh, we're going to talk about um, in the first panel discussion this morning. Um, for those who haven't met me yet, my name is Brian Whedon. I'm the technical advisor for Secure World Foundation. Uh, I, a uh, long time ago, I used to be an Air Force guy myself doing SSA orbital analysis. Uh, for the last 10 years, I have been uh, basically a policy wonk um, and, you know, doing analysis of a different type than orbital mechanics. Um, I think this particular topic, space traffic management, is a, a very apropos topic for the policy forum uh, because it is a big policy issue that is being debated uh, within the U.S. government at this moment. Uh, public policy is basically how, why, and to what effect governments do something or don't do something. Um, and along those lines, this is a, a topic where the government is in the middle of a multi-year discussion, uh, or as Doug mentioned, a, a heated discussion sometimes, <laughs> about whether or not or what they do on space traffic management. Uh, and, and there's a few reasons why this issue is, uh, has become of more interest and has greater salience last several years. Um, as was mentioned, you know, the growing congested part of space, and not just the space debris part of it, but the plan for these mega constellations. Um, the uh, last 10 years, there were somewhere around 1,500 satellites launched, functional satellites. The estimate for the next 10 years is between 3,500 and 9,000 functional satellites depending upon what you believe, the, the probability of all the projected commercial constellations actually coming to fruition. Um, and as mentioned, you know, if that happens, that will greatly increase the conjunction rate uh, because a lot of these satellites are going to the same general area. Um, also, General Thompson mentioned, you know, the, the, the issue of contested space has grown much more prominent in the last several years. Uh, and so that has a piece of this discussion. Uh, we're looking at, you know, also innovative new activities on orbit, where companies are looking to do things on orbit that don't quite fall into some of the existing licensing frameworks that we have. So how do we handle that? So all of that is wrapped up into this discussion of space traffic management. Uh, it talks about, you know, what changes should be made to the U.S. government's framework for oversight of government acti uh, of commercial act of activities in space. How do we increase the safety and efficiency of space activities? Uh, and, you know, how do we enhance the data that's being provided to do that? And should part of that data mission, the part of the SSA mission, go to someone other than the DOD? So I hope we're going to try and uh, get at some of those issues in today's discussion. Um, I've asked each panelist to give a few minutes of brief opening remarks, uh, and then I've got some questions I'm going to ask them, um, and I would please ask that all of you uh, text them some questions, and uh, we will hope I will pull out those and, and we'll ask those. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce each of the panelists to start with, uh, and then we'll have them do their opening remarks. Uh, so, this is not in the order I wrote it down. Okay. So, immediately next to me <laughs> is Mr. Steph Furl. Uh, Steph is currently the Space Traffic Management Lead and Orbital Debris Subject Expert for the FAA Office of Commercial Space Transportation. In that role, Steph is responsible for overseeing a variety of activities to promote and ensure orbital safety including projects and initiatives towards building a civil space traffic capability. He also supports the development of national space policy and advances safety issues for launch vehicles. Prior to joining the FAA, Steph had a long career in the United States Air Force, where he worked on missile warning, space situation awareness, and policy, including a stint in the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, sitting next to him is Mr. Myland Pride. Myland is the Director of Government and Legislative Affairs for Intelsat General provide strategic direction for legislative and government affairs, policy and strategy development, and executive and legislative branch outreach. Represents Intelsat General's interests with the government, associations, industry groups. Prior to joining Intelsat, he also had a long career with the United States Air Force, uh, working in the nuclear world and in space, but of course not together at the same time. Uh, and he has experience both in Air Force Space Command, Joint Staff, and with the National Reconnaissance Office. Next we have uh, Joseph Kohler, is a Senior Advisor at the Office of Secretary of Defense for Space Policy, i.e. Doug Levero. 
Uh, in this position, he serves as a thought leader and a senior staff analyst responsible for providing technical advice and analyzing space-related U.S. government and DOD policy matters. His portfolio includes space traffic management, space situation awareness, congressional engagement, and public affairs. Prior to this assignment, Dr. Kohler worked at the Los Alamos National Laboratory on space weather and satellite conjunction analysis, uh, and he has a PhD in astrophysics. It means he'll fit right in with this audience. Um, and last but definitely not least is Doug Hendricks. He's the CEO and co-founder of ExoAnalytics, a company that operates, owns, and maintains a global network of space tracking telescopes and provides a variety of commercial SSA services and data to both the government and private customers. Doug is a physicist by training and has extensive experience in analytics, algorithms, and leading scientific engineering teams. Uh, also, as his company blog puts it, he's an expert in physics, Mexican food, and Kelly Clarkson's music. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure you get more questions on one of those topics today than maybe the other topics, but maybe not. I mean, there may be some, you know, some other fans in the audience. Uh, so I think, Mylon, I'm going to ask you to go first uh, okay. and just kind of talk about, hopefully, what the satellite operator thinks of this whole subject. Thank you. And I'm, I'm sitting here staring at Steph, you know, 27 years ago when we graduated the academy together, and then we were in the Air Force together. And uh, joint staff, we, we served, I think he actually worked for me on the joint staff. Actually, I, I was just taking his direction. And uh, we wrote the National, uh, the, the Guevara mentioned the 2010 National Space Policy. We're active in helping to write that, and John Cartwright beating us up every day. Um, and now we sit here, um, I on the commercial side, Steph on the civil side, talking about uh, something we've been talking about for 27 years, and that's uh, space situation awareness, uh, now space traffic management, a term we used to not could use, but now we can use again. And um, it, it, shockingly, we're still in agreement about most things. So, um, you know, and I'm here sort of representing uh, a, a little industry, um, but I'll tell you, both individual companies, um, collectively and individually uh, are uh, across many forums to include uh, organizations such as Satellite Industry Association, the NDIA, the National Defense Industrial Association. They're very active in this debate and we'll continue to be active in this debate. But I want to talk about kind of four things that uh, they, they may be kind of my opinions, but I think that for the most part, uh, I hope I get a lot of head nods from the folks here that are in industry and our international partners. Um, the first thing I would say regarding this transition from the Department of Defense to a civil organization and space traffic management is to do no harm. I think that most would agree that that is probably the most critical thing. Um, when it comes to the JSPOC, the uh, Joint Space Operations Center, the work that they're doing um, is critical and they're still kind of the only game in town. Uh, I'll tell you, they get beat up a lot, but they deserve a lot of credit for the things that they're doing um, uh, regarding the timeliness of the data that they share. Um, they're really trying to increase the amount of data that they give to organizations such as the Space Data Association, the work that they're doing with international partnerships. Um, they have a tough, tough job. They have a uh, few resources, um, and for the, the work that they're doing is very helpful, and we would hope that in any transition that that work continues. Um, the second thing, and I think this is where some of the industry partners would sort of uh, disagree, is involves what I will call smart regulation. I think Doug Lavero called it good management. Um, many commercial operators think that all regulation is bad. They think that it would stifle innovation, it would add cost. Um, but I'll tell you, I think the majority, and I'll talk for uh, geospace operators, think that smart regulation through a civil organization is probably needed. Um, you know, as we, my company especially, deal with things like uh, rendezvous and proximity operations, um, physical interference, and a host of other issues from potentially nefarious actors, um, we're, we're constantly faced with the challenge that there's really no international standards, there's no international regulations. Um, we have some norms amongst us, but not others, not everybody follows those. So the key is for regulation that, that doesn't put U.S. industry at an advantage, especially in the near term, as we may, we being the United States, sort of has the only sort of regulatory apparatus for some of these activities in existence. But um, the key is to promote um, activities that really get to spaceflight safety. Um, uh, the, initially, the regulatory focus may be on things such as debris mitigation, which uh, Doug Lavero mentioned, um, how satellites can be sensed 
from terrestrial uh, sensors, um, the ability to maneuver in the space of debris or other objects, and uh, then implementing the best practices that we've been working on for a long time. I've been involved with those for at least 12, 13 years uh, that the U.S. and other nations are promoting at uh, various international forums. Uh, the third thing, and also very important and near and dear to a lot of the folks in this room, is, is as you transition from the DOD to any sort of a civil organization, and I think Dr. Neal and I know that uh, Steph here understands this, you've got to rely on commercial capabilities. Um, I spent 10 years in the Pentagon, and uh, both on the, on the, on the uh, programma programmatic side, the policy side, and the requirement side. And uh, I'm just, the systems that we have in place from requirements generation and acquisition are just not capable of maintaining the standards that are needed in this mission area. The only way that I think that any entity can keep up with, with the capabilities that are needed to do the work that needs to be done for, for a space situation awareness it is, has to be commercialized. Um, they can react quicker, I think they can do it cheaper, timelier, and they can truly throw, uh, as I call, the, the experts, the PhDs at the problem on a regular basis. So I think that that's a, a very key point. And the fourth and final thing I want to talk about is we have a great opportunity as we transition from the Department of Defense, who has been doing this mission area for, obviously, from the beginning and doing a fantastic job, as we transition to a potential civil organization that would do this mission area, we can sort of begin with the, with the end in mind. And uh, there's been lots written about this, I think, since the early 80s, the first paper that I read that discussed sort of a three-step approach to transitioning to an international organization that would do this, and that is, um, first, you gotta sort of get the data right to include the standards. Um, you gotta kind of figure out how you would disseminate that data, and then you gotta figure out how to organize to disseminate that data. As we transition from the Department of Defense, I think an organization such as the FAA has a very unique opportunity to not only um, get the data right and the data standards right, but to really start working with the State Department, OSD, and others, and of course our international partners, um, to provide U.S. leadership as we, as we uh, move toward an international organization. Because this is not a U.S. problem, this is an international problem, and the only way it will truly be resolved is with an international organization. With that, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Um, Joseph? Thank you, Brian. Thanks for inviting me again. Um, it's like my fourth or fifth time here in Maui. I really enjoy coming back here. But uh, the topic today is space traffic management. As you all know, the DOD has been doing actually space traffic monitoring uh, for many decades since the early space age. That includes um, tracking active satellites, tracking debris, providing services based on that data, providing conjunction analysis, and so forth. But um, the time is really changing now, and uh, part of my portfolio is also uh, looking at uh, commercial remote sensing policies that are coming in. And it really illustrates that uh, how the environment is changing. We're moving from space 1.0 to space 2.0, some people call it also the space renaissance. And um, that includes uh, large constellation, very innovative activities like rendezvous and proximity operations, satellite servicing, and so forth. Um, in particular, uh, space traffic management, I think uh, the large constellations are one part that needs to be addressed. Uh, so large constellations are proposed by SpaceX, by OneWeb, by Planet, by Spire, and so forth, and that includes hundreds to thousands of satellites, very large constellations indeed. And if uh, some of those are still just uh, proposal paper concepts at this point, but if they do come true, just a few of those, it could really double or triple the number of active satellites uh, that need to be managed somehow. And all this has to be done in a fiscally constrained environment. Um, that means, um, is really DOD the right place to do that? And uh, like Milan said earlier, it's an international, it's, it's not just a DOD problem, it's, it's not just a US problem, it's an international problem. And how do we assure the long-term sustainability and uh, the safe operations for, for existing operators, you know, with large constellations coming online? 
So that really illustrates how we need to move from space traffic monitoring to a space traffic management regime. And uh, as I said earlier, DoD is really not the right place to do a management. Uh, I've had many discussions on space traffic management or some people want to, in DoD, would call it space traffic control, but you do not want DoD to control your traffic. It could be, it could be a bad idea at some points, and I don't want to uh, repeat some of the ideas that have been mentioned. <laughs> so what do we really need? Uh, one is the underlying foundation of all that, of all space traffic management is uh, space situational awareness. So we need uh, better SSA, we need better algorithms, uh, better tools, better systems to monitor space, which really provides the foundation for everything that comes on top of that, which is the management part. And that's what this conference is great about. It's the collaborative environment uh, to bring forward new tools, new algorithms, and new methods and how to do that better. Number two, really, um, I don't like so much the word of uh, transitioning space traffic management from a DOD to a civil. I like to call it more a collaborative environment because in the end we still operate in the same joint, jointly in the same environment. So I like to call it more of a, a collaboration on space traffic management jointly with a, a civil agency um, because um, you know, really, it's, it's a joint operation, that, uh, a joint environment that we need to operate in. And um, how do we do that in a fiscally constrained environment? So that's what most of the discussions are today about. So we have, uh, we're currently in the process of uh, design, designing and defining what that collaboration is with a civil agency, because we think that's probably most suitable. And uh, so, for example, we have uh, jointly written a report recently delivered to Congress, and I'm sure Steph will talk about it earlier, uh, uh, laying out how th th that is actually feasible to have a, a civil agency provide safety, uh, safety of operation information and so forth, uh, in, in, in addition to what DOD is providing. And I think that's probably the most sensible, sensible thing to do. And number three is, um, and the re or let me actually go back to that. The reason why we're looking at a civil agency because uh, DOD is not a regulatory uh, department or a regulatory agency, right? So really, it needs to have a. It needs to be coming from a regular uh, an agency or a department that has regulatory authority, and uh, that leads me now to the third point. It's this. The third thing that we need is safety standards and uh, rules, maybe, maybe not rules right away, but standards and guidelines that lead in the future then to maybe rules and some regulations. Um, we, we need to remove some rules to keep the industry innovative and we need to maybe create some sensible guidelines. And that really, you need two things for that. And number one is you need, if you want to create light touch rules and guidelines or standards, you need industry participation. And so I really call out, we call out always to the industry to help us with that because uh, you do not want the government to start from scratch with rules. It really needs to come from the industry because uh, only the industry would understand what that light touch rule or guideline is that would enable them to keep on with the innovation uh, and provide long-term sustainability for the operations um, and not come with a heavy hand from the government. So it really needs a lot of industry participation in that. And uh, the second part is you need to have an, uh, a department or an agency with a, a uh, regulatory mandate. And so um, I think that kind of summarizes the discussion that uh, I wanted to bring up and uh, hand back to Brian. Great, thank you. Um, Steph? Uh, well, thank you for inviting me, aloha. Uh, aloha nui loa. And uh, my, uh, my wife is from Lanai, so I'm, I feel like I'm at home back here. And uh, if you hear a loud ruckus from the pool, it's my ohana, and they have invaded. So, so why, why am I here? Why is the FAA here? We've been coming to uh, Amos for a number of years because we are the Office of Commercial Space Transportation. We were formerly under the Department of Transportation and we were moved under the FAA. 
And we have a mission already um, for the safety, the regulation, the oversight, facilitate, promote, and encourage for space flight, uh, launch, and reentry. And so for space traffic management, we think that, that that fits right in with that. I mean, that is literally what we're currently doing for the U.S. industry. And we're a little different than the rest of the FAA in that aspect because we're doing it for the U.S. involvement worldwide. So a launch out of Australia, a launch out of the UK, if it's US launch, we will be overseeing and regulating that. And that's, that's a difference from us and the rest of the FAA. We also look at some environmental aspects which are <clears throat> similar to um, the Maritime Administration. And, and so we have some things in common there where in the aviation environment, when there's an accident, it, it clears out of the aviation um, area pretty quickly. And, uh, but that's not the same in the maritime environment, and that's not the same in the, uh, in the space environment. So we look at this more from a transportation focus. We have an awful lot of aviation aspects that we have to do as well because these rockets transition through the national airspace. So the, uh, the FAA is a, is a very good place for us currently, but we really focus our efforts on the whole transportation piece. So we've been looking into space traffic management for a number of years since the 2010, basically, when we started looking at, uh, it, as a, uh, a government organization, what are we going to do about space traffic management? We see it coming, we see the issues, we really have to start addressing it. And so I, I think we're really at a paradigm change right now. So there was a very smart man in Alexandria, um, the original one, and so uh, and he had a, a geocentric view of the universe, that the Earth is the center. And it lasted for about 1400 years. And it worked for most of the time. I mean, your observations were close. Um, and I think that today we're changing from a DOD centric viewpoint of this is how we operate to one that's different. Um, although I would say that Copernicus didn't get it right the first time either. He, uh, he said that it was all circles and it took another 60 years before somebody came along and said, no, uh, they're ellipses. Um, details, details. So they're, they're the details. But I think we're at a paradigm shift right now where we are saying there is a congested environment and it's only going to get more complicated. And if I could add another C, that's what I would add, is that it's going to be very complicated. And, and we see that in our launch aspects where we used to have just traditional, perhaps EELVs, expendable launch vehicles. A rocket goes up, falls into the ocean, parts of it, the rest of it stay up on orbit and then things started getting more and more and more complicated and exponentially, I would add. Um, so today, even our commercial launch aspects, and we're trying to decide, is that a reusable launch vehicle? Is it an expendable launch vehicle? What, what makes it? How, how do you qualify a reusable launch vehicle? Um, we have uh, hybrid launch vehicles, how do we handle them? So the, the complicated piece has really um, grown to be a very big part. And, so we have the Outer Space Treaty that says that non-governmental activities have to be supervised by the government, which is what we do for launch. And we think that the FAA should do the same type of activities on orbit. We should contribute, we should focus on safety, we should focus on the preservation of the environment. So those would be our missions. And, and why now, like I mentioned, the complexity isn't going to go away. It's only going to get more complicated. Uh, with um, RPO, rendezvous proximity operations, satellite servicing, mining, um, all of the types of activities that we see that are on the future to include mega constellations, the complexity is, is there and, and it's real and it's happening now. And so the government, we are never one to uh, act early. Um, I think we're almost behind the power curve on this, but we are working together to build a common understanding is what I think was what we want to have with the Department of Defense and all of our civil partners and our interagency, because I think that's what really enables the space traffic management picture as we go, is that common understanding of, of how things are going to happen, how things are going to interact, and so we're really working hard on that. Now, the 110 report, I and renamed my oldest child that. That's how much time I've spent on that report and uh, a couple others. So we had our discussions, a couple of discussions with Congress, and they responded. Ah, so the background on the 110 report. You didn't grow up with it like I did. Um, so the 110 report was a, was a question posed by Congress on the feasibility of a civil agency or a different agency providing safety-related space SSA um, data to non-governmental or non-national security um, users. 
And so that question was asked to us by Congress, and we had about six months to answer the question. It's one of 12 reports that were signed in the, the Space Act, and we were assigned six of them, so we promptly canceled all leave. And, uh, and we've been working hard, and so we've turned in the 110 report, which was a collaborative report between us and the Department of Defense and as well as the rest of the agency to include NASA and all of our other um, stakeholders. And we looked at it and said, is it feasible for a civil agency to provide this data? And the answer was yes. There were a number of caveats, and I think they all go towards a common understanding. I mean, one of the largest ones is, is that while Providing this is not an inherently military mission. It, it could be inherently governmental. There are definitely governmental aspects of it. There are commercial opportunities that are very large and very relevant that should be played upon because the, the best data provides the best answer. And so there are aspects of that. But there was also a notice that we've seen a, a large paradigm shift on the national defense side and their job is getting more complicated. And so, this isn't a transfer of systems and personnel or funding from the Department of Defense. They're, they're using everything they have to their best ability. And so this isn't taking anything from them. Uh, and we think that with some modest resources, we, we're already doing this mission for launch and reentry that in a smart, fiscally constrained way, we, we could partner and provide this. So that was the 110 report. It was recently submitted to Congress, and uh, there are a number of articles online. There was also a 109 report, which is a report about the management of new and emerging um, commercial space activities and how we should do that. And that was another report that was turned in that was led by uh, Dr. Holdren of the Office of Science and Technology and Policy in the White House. And that one also said that they believe that the, the practical way to do this is to have the FAA manage that activity through a uh, what we call like an, a payload review, which is a mission review. It's where uh, an operator comes to the FAA and provides information about what they're planning on doing. And then we work with all the stakeholders within the, uh, the government to say, does this meet our national security concerns, our, our foreign policy interests, our treaty obligations, our safety obligations? And so we are almost, uh, we're the entry point. And we are that way right now for commercial launch because if you're going to be a U.S. launcher, you come to us and provide it. And so we've done this for a number of commercial companies. We've done it for um, some rendezvous, or some satellite servicing. Uh, the big one that made the news was uh, the mining activities, the lunar mining activities, where we've looked at that. But we've all felt that while these are great activities and they should be encouraged and they should be promoted, that we just didn't feel that the U.S. had the correct regulatory structure to oversee those. And so this mission authorization that was proposed is something that will cover that. And I think it is the light touch that, that we've heard. Um, so I have written a DODI, a Department of Defense Instruction, and I have written a regulation. And I will tell you that it is way harder to write a regulation than it is to do an instruction in the Department of Defense. It is an extremely difficult task. And so there are a number of caveats built in, controls built in to make sure that when when you want to regulate, it seems like your own agency, the, the, the questions that are asked is why, why this, why this, why this, what? You have to prove an awful lot. And it also, all of our regulations go out for public comment. Um, so uh, in addition, so you get back an awful lot of comments. So I think that what we have today are good regulations. Our problems are often not good regulations, they're old regulations, because it is difficult to redo a regulation. It's, it's a very long and, and arduous process. And so we like to get it right the first time, and a light approach is probably the best way to do that. Uh, a heavy-handed approach gets you uh, in a lot of trouble very quickly on that. But I think our problems aren't as much in heavy-handed, it's outdated. And so we've asked for resources from Congress, we've asked for funding and support, we've asked for authorization um, to handle all of these to make sure that we can support the, the mission for space traffic and, and the, as well as the mission authorizations for those new and emerging missions. Great, thank you. Um, and last but definitely not least, Doug, uh, to kind of tie in that commercial SSA perspective that, that a couple of other people mentioned. Okay, thanks, Brian, for inviting me. Um, thank you, Joseph. This is my first time on a panel, and I would have felt really awful if everyone had a tablet except for me. So, Joseph, thanks for bringing a paper and pen. Um, Mylan, thanks for uh, saying we need commercial SSA. Um, that's why I'm here. I'll think of something to thank you for later, Stephen. I didn't come up with anything. Sorry. <laughs> Um, 
So I would like to set the record straight. I would like to add commercial SSA to physics, Mexican food, and Kelly Clarkson. Um, I'll tell you all I know about it. So these will be very short opening remarks. Um, I'll do very poorly without PowerPoint. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to do this without that. Um, but I'm gonna, who I'm talking to are the aspiring commercial SSA data providers and tool and software and service providers out there. So there's, there's a number of you out there. You've probably won and you know, you've written and won several SBIRs or small business contracts and you've worked for the US government. And EXO, we, we started in the same place a lot of you are. But I will tell you that this is an emerging market, this commercial SSA market. And it's comprised of several segments. And we've actually sold data commercially into all of them. So that includes the US military, Intel, uh, US civilians. We work with a number of partners. So we work with a company called AGI. We sell them our data. And, and they resell it internationally, for example, to uh, foreign governments. Um, we, have, we work with a company uh, called Schaefer. They're looking at the US government um, civilian market, NASA, FAA, looking if that becomes a market, uh, they're definitely looking to sell there. Um, there's also a group, a market that sort of transcends all the international boundaries, the commercial owners and operators. And we are under very strict NDAs with those folks. And uh, I, mean, I can't imagine a worse breach of an NDA than sitting in a room of, I don't know, what, 677 people, whatever that was. Um, so I'll have to be very careful. Um, so I won't say who we work for, but I will say there is a very growing market there. And one of the challenges of addressing all of these markets are all the same. Um, SSA is sort of like an insurance policy. So if you're like me, you have a home and you have a car and you want to pay the least for your premium and you want to maximize your deductible to get that low premium. And I, I, my home's never burned down. So that's never, that's never hurt me. Um, and I've only been at fault for a few accidents, um, and so I'm still insured, I still have a license. And so using that metaphor, SSA is an insurance policy, no commercial owner and operator has lost their house, they haven't lost their business over a collision or anything bad that's happened in space. And there have been, there have been collisions, but no one was found at fault, and so nobody lost their insurance policy. And there's a free provider um, called spacetrack.org and they offer you a, a zero dollar premium and they give you a okay it's okay and I'm not going to say anything bad about it I think Doug you did a good job of whatever you said I won't say what you said um, General Thompson uh, put it exactly right we've reached the point where it, the world is ready for the commercial providers to innovate outside of their normal customer base and that's where the rapid innovation comes from and you're gonna drive it. All the people in this room are gonna drive it once you start to address this market. Um, so logistically, the challenge is, it's funny, because Doug, you hit upon it exactly. It's about, and I'm gonna look at my notes. Um, okay, this, this was a great statement. Yeah, collisions, no problem. There aren't gonna be many collisions, no problem. So that's gonna be tough. You gotta overcome the fact that no one's really that worried about collisions but they are trying to save money and mission life uh, to, to avoid unnecessary maneuvers. So you're affecting the bottom line as far as cost savings. Um, we don't have published standards. And so this is, this is the big thing. This is the big thing that, that keeps you out of the market, um, whether it's US government, DOD Intel, commercial owners and operators, foreign governments, is that there's sort of a four-step process to winning a customer. And us working with partners like AGI, Schaefer, um, others I can't name, have had to go through this process one at a time with every single customer. So there's, you know, there's one US government customer, but it's actually 30, 40, 50 of them. And they don't always talk well to one another, and they don't trust you. So the first thing you have to do is convince them they have a problem. So I'll give you an example of some conversations. These will be paraphrased, so don't, don't quote me. Um, commercial owner and operator or US government, you have a problem. No, I don't. You have a problem. I don't. You don't really know where your satellite is. Yes, I do. No, you don't. Yes, I do. And so you can imagine how our, you know, our, our initial attempts to grow this commercial market were, were very difficult. Um, a lot of folks did a lot of heavy lifting. I would say 2014, 2015, I think the comp spot was fantastic in getting out awareness. Um, other companies started stepping up. I mentioned Schaefer as well as some others we work with I can't name. 
uh, to go out there and demonstrate there was a problem. Okay, so that's number one. And, and I think people agree now, and Doug, you, you said it, there's a problem. Okay, thank you. Number two, I have a solution to your problem. Mm, I can solve my own problems. <laughs> that's kind of where we are now, <laughs> with a lot of them. Um, but we're making progress. But the problem is you have to do that with, with all of them, one at a time. There are no standards. There's no place you can go and say, hey, if I bring my data in here, someone can say his data is OK. Everybody learns it the first time. And they'll all immediately tell you your data is garbage. The first thing they're going to tell you, it's garbage. And it'll be for various reasons. You'll have a timing bias in your, in your data. Well, you can correct that. That doesn't matter. Your data is garbage. Uh, maybe you're in a slightly different coordinate frame. Um, a lot of people in here have you know, heard of the stellar aberration. Um, you know, okay. Well, maybe not a lot of people who do ranging with antennas have heard of it. So that's not a part of their processing. And there are other things. And you have to work through those technical details with the technical guys on the other side of the fence that think they're smarter than you, even though you know you're smarter than them, so they're right, right? So that takes a long time, a heck of a long time. Um, and some people take in TLE, some people take in RI deck, some people don't take in any of it. They just take in range or time, you know, how long did my signal take to get back and forth. So you got to do all of this. That's number two. We're only halfway through this list. Uh, you have to establish trust. And hopefully in this process of convincing them your day is good, you have established trust. Okay, and lastly, and this is the big one, and uh, Paul Welsh wrote an article, and he hit the nail on the head. You're now an aspiring commercial SSA data provider or product provider. You have to sign a service level agreement. You can't just say, hey, I'm a smart guy. I do this great stuff. Here it is. Look, and I'll give it to you whenever you want it. No, you have to guarantee you'll deliver it. 363 days out of 365, whatever it is, you have to sign up. It's a legal document. And if you fail to do it, I don't know what happens. I haven't read any of ours. I'm afraid to. To be quite honest, I don't want to read that stuff. So that's how you get in. And um, it's important that people ha feel that there's a business case to do this. And so there is another impediment. It's that free insurance policy. And so I'm not going to suggest anything because honestly, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just going to ask a question. I'll ask two questions. One would be, and I can answer it later if anyone wants to know the answer. It's up to my, you know, the way I see it. What would ha and I, say, I said this yesterday to Joseph and he gave me a very strange look, but I'm going to ask it anyway. He knows what it is. You know, what would happen if tomorrow uh, spacetrack.org was shut down? What would happen? Think about it. Um, and I won't answer it, and we can talk about it later. But number two, less drastic, what would happen if Spacetrack started becoming a place to publish other catalogs? So there are people with catalogs. AGI's got a catalog. We have a catalog. Um, there are catalogs out there. And I will tell you that there are enough sensor providers out there to handle all the orbit genes. Leo, Leo, Geo, Mio. GTO is still difficult for everybody. So uh, the Leo Labs um, operates the Pfizer radar up in Alaska. They're building another one in Texas that's a little different design. Raytheon Space Radar, I know they're dying to sell their data. They would love to sell their data. Uh, Lockheed, you know, when they're done with their uh, New Jersey radar, would they want to bring it in? Uh, there's a deep space radar in Canada that AGI signed up. There are data providers. There are people, everyone in this room, and there's people know how to take that data and turn it into products that can go into a catalog. There are people that maintain catalogs. And at ExoAnalytic, we don't have a lot of people that like talking to humans. Okay? And it's probably a lot of people in this audience. So there are companies that specialize in talking to humans, um, and those would be some of the people we work with. Um, those, they're important too. And it's, there's a whole chain that builds between you collected photons and somebody did something with your data, whether it's in the JIGSPOC, the JSPOC, it's Intelsat, it's SES. Um, but I know all the tools are out there in the community. They're probably in this room. Um, we just have to figure out how to put them together. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so, I have a, a set of uh, questions that I've, that I've got myself, and there's been some questions coming in. To remind everyone that if you do have some questions, you know, please text them in, and I will see what we can do to get them into the queue over the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Um, I just lost my question page. Okay. Uh, 
So, so Joseph, uh, one of the questions is, you know, basically gets to what is the relationship between the DOD and the DOT? You talked about building this collaboration between the two. Um, the specific question is, you know, is there an MOU between them to do this transition? I'll broaden that out and say, you know, are there discussions of interagency mechanisms to kind of build a relationship between the DOD, the DOT, and other entities, um, and, and, and what might those look like? So we, we, there is no MOU at this point. I mean, we've discussed uh, putting it into writing in, certain pl um, in a certain way, and perhaps that's what we're going to end up doing. But we've started this discussion um, um, 2010, but I think it got really serious in uh, like maybe a year, a year and a half ago. And then in particular, once we had uh, the requirement in the Commercial Space uh, Launch Act to provide a report to Congress on the feasibility of a civil agency providing safety of flight information, I think the discussions got really serious at that point. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we had regular meetings and we were trying to discuss and find different ways in how we can work this collaboration. And um, I think I mentioned it earlier that we're currently working on a, a poem, uh, so a plan of operation and, and with specific guidelines, uh, specific uh, timelines in how uh, this joint collaborative environment could, could uh, be developed and worked out. So that's, and I think the discussions are very fruitful, uh, they're very positive, and I think we're, we're making very good progress. So along those lines, uh, you know, there are other systems, for example, GPS, where you have a capability that has interagency collaboration and management and oversight. Is, you know, but there's some pretty rigorous structures that have been put in place to handle that. Is that a, a, a potential destination you see might happening for SSA or space traffic management? Yes, a, a structure has to be put in place. Uh, the rules and responsibilities have to be clearly established, and that's what we're working on at this point. I'm trying to figure out what is the right, uh, right set of responsibility. Who is going to handle what in what environment? And Steph, you may yeah. Want to add let me to that from too. the from the DOT. We don't have a memorandum of understanding, but but we do have an understanding. Um, we uh, we understand, and we're working together. I mean, this this is a whole of government issue, and, and throughout the interagency. Um, and we are not leaving out any of the other stakeholders. I mean, although it is a DOD DOT, we are the prime stakeholders on this part here, but, but I would say that the other interagency partners, NOAA, NASA, and even to the point the FCC, um, and that's not to say the FCC is bad, um, but, but they are all involved in this. And so we do have an understanding, and, and we've had an awful lot of meetings to discuss that. And I, I think that we haven't just written down a memorandum because we are honestly so busy negotiating and already discussing that a memorandum really solidifies where we're going to go, and we're still working on where we're going with that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stay with you. Uh, right. There's a question here that basically says, uh, um, you know, have you thought about what the role of NASA or other agencies are? I'm gonna expand that and say, you know, make the case for why FAAST is the right entity to do this and not the FCC or NOAA or NASA or other agencies that might have some part of the competence. Is this like spelling before format? If I get it wrong, do I have to sit down? <laughs> um, so so the, the, the argument has been made, and, and we, we had a number of discussions in the Department of Transportation about who should this be, and, and it should it be us. And so we've actually had to convince our leadership that yes, this is a responsibility that, that we, the DOT, need to, and should take on. Uh, because th this is about safety. So what we're talking about here isn't primarily what you're doing on orbit. And the same thing we do with aviation. If you're flying your plane from here to there, we don't ask you why are you going there. That's immigration. I'll take care of that. Um, but for us, that's the same thing. We want to know, are you getting from here to there safely? And on orbit, it's the same thing. And so we looked at, should the FCC take on this role? And they have a large role. The FCC has been a great partner in handling different aspects and making sure that oversight that we have today is correct and appropriate. And so they have some great leverage even on to, to ensure that international support that they follow some of the rules. So the FCC is good. But we didn't feel that the FCC was an appropriate place for orbital safety. You just don't think of that. Their realm is frequency. Um, we looked at NOAA and Department of Commerce, and so that's come up before. And, uh, and I'm not trying to speak for the Commerce Department. They do an awful lot of work, but it didn't seem that 
the safety aspect was, which is really, in our opinion, the, the core issue here. The con congested aspects aren't about the commerce. I mean, that's kind of the competitive area. But this is really congested. This is safety related. And so what agency handles that? That's for us in the US, it's the Department of Transportation. Um, and the Office of Commercial Space Transportation, which was under DOT and now is under FAA, is, is the place where we handle that. So that would be my argument. That's what we've gone forward is that this is a safety issue. It's core to the current missions of the Department of Transportation. And that's why we think that we are a very good place for that. So the second part of the question that, that, that was actually come in was, you know, what about creating a new entity? Or, or I would say, you know, there have been questions people in the, in the past have said, well, if we were doing a perfect world doing from scratch, you might have a all singing, all dancing, right. you know, Coast Guard right. for space kind of a thing. Do you see it going there eventually, or or do you see this division of labor kind of being around for a while? So, so this argument, having been an Air Force officer and been a space officer in the Air Force, you know, I, I've heard the space force, you know, but but it's never happened. But I, I'm not so sure that for us. Um, we wouldn't become a separate entity or wouldn't become in, in, in the Department of Transportation. Now, currently, it's in the FAA. We have a very large role in partnering with the airspace personnel um, for that aspect. But it, it really would depend on how much of the mission was assigned to the Secretary of Transportation and then how the Secretary, he or she felt, would be the best to organize that. So if we take on a larger on-orbit piece and it becomes relevant that or becomes a uh, apparent that, that you know the FAA really ends up with a split mission where this part is doing an entirely different mission and then this part when I mean entirely uh, you know the majority of their focus is that then it, it's up to the secretary and the administrator to work out exactly how that is I, I'm not ruling it out mm -hmm. I would probably be shot if I pr suggested it mm -hmm. uh, so Mylan uh, there was uh, in the previous uh, keynotes and Q&A there was a discussion about kind of norms of behavior and rules of the road in space. You know, that's been something that the governments have been talking about for the last several years with, I would say, you know, mixed progress. Do you think that industry and industry operators might be willing to take a bigger role in helping establish what those norms might be? Yeah, I mean, back in a prior life when I was on active duty, I've traveled to Russia a couple of times. I was in Vienna a couple of times talking about transparency and confidence building measures and best practices. And I, oh, by the way, I think the State Department and OSD, considering the uh, sort of adver adversarial relationship that we have with certain countries, have done an amazing job at keeping the noodle at least moving forward, though it is a noodle moving very slowly forward. Um, I, I do believe, and there have been discussions in various industry organizations about taking uh, a role. I, I know that at the uh, COPUS, the delegation that goes to COPUS, uh, we have representation there. In fact, I think Mr. Skinner's in the audience, maybe, or he's somewhere around here. I think I saw him. He's normally an attendee at this event. But, um, and we do have uh, industry representation in those uh, forums. Um, I, I, as I mentioned previously, I think that this, uh, this is truly a global endeavor um, for space traffic management. And I think that any organization that would take this on, just like the DOD has, will also stay engaged in, those, in the long-term sustainability, the best practices work, uh, the other work that's going on at COPUS and other forums, because it, it is a, a, a global endeavor. So. Well, so, to, so I'll open that up to, to everyone. You know, a couple of questions have asked, what about the international piece of this, right? You know, the U.S. government only has jurisdiction over U.S. government satellites, and specifically you guys have jurisdiction over U.S. commercial satellites. So how do you take, you know, what is this division between what the U.S. government does and what, how you take this internationally? What, what might that look like? Okay, so I'll, I'll start off with the international piece. Um, for launch, uh, we develop a, a large number of rules and regulations for the safety of the uninvolved public. public. And, and so what we see is there, there are only so many countries that are launching and they come to the FAA. We have discussions and encourage them to adopt similar rules. And so they do that. And when they build a spaceport, um, they come to us and they say, well, how do you regulate spaceports? And, and we'll take what works for our country and <clears throat> we'll implement those. And so I think there's a, a role for the U.S. if we want to be a leader in these aspects to, to be the forefront of this, to develop those best practices, those rules, those regulations where appropriate 
and then encourage our partners or the interagency or the international, I should say, to follow the same type of rules. I and mean, we're developing these rules for a reason. It's usually safety. We think that they're appropriate for other countries to follow. Now, that said, on orbit, uh, there is a country that has the most to lose, and that would be the country that uses space the most. That would probably be the United States. And so we have a vested interest in ensuring that those rules and procedures that we adopt, that we advocate for other countries to adopt the same thing. And we do this for orbital debris mitigation, we do it at launch, we do it under spaceports. And so I think that for space traffic management, we would do the same way. Uh, we, we need to understand exactly the best rules and practices that the United States is going to do, and then we need to advocate those internationally. In, in just 10 seconds, he's right. We have to lead right. because all your yeah, homework. Right, exactly. years. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we have we I think we lead just like we led for international civil aviation rules. You know, there's a history there, but the the only thing I will say is that we have to be very careful as we take a leadership role that in the in the near term that the um, the light touch as these gentlemen both like to use. Um, I'm kind of worried sitting between you two, but um, uh, <laughs> the light touch that you guys apply, you just have to make sure that in the in the near term it doesn't adversely affect U.S. companies uh, uh, adversely uh, in in comparison to our international competitors. And I think that there's been a great dialogue, and most people are confident that that will not happen. So, I think there's really an opportunity now for the U.S. to to show leadership, um, as history shows, uh, others usually follow a leader. And so if, if a country, or in particular the number one space operator, which is the United States, shows that leadership, I believe other countries will follow. And I think we've done similar things before in the realm of uh, orbital debris mitigation guidelines. I think that's a great example because uh, they're guidelines, they're not rules or law, they're guidelines that were developed 25 years ago by NASA. They were then slowly adopted into a US government guideline and then they were promulgated internationally, they were endorsed by COPIUS and EON and uh, with the uh, IADC guidelines. And you know, 20, it started 25 years ago, so it's a long process, but today we're in a, an environment where other countries and operators are pointing fingers and saying, hey, you're not following those guidelines. So it actually they do have an effect. Uh, they're, they're not law or a treaty, they're guidelines, but I think they, they do have an effect, and uh, I think they, the, the orbital debris mitigation guidelines were successful in that sense. But we also have to realize that they're 25 years old now. And in today's operational environment where uh, operators are proposing uh, a space renaissance or a rethinking of how we operate in the sense of fail often and fail early, if we have that paradigm shift with operations in space, uh, fail often and early, leaving uh, uh, debris behind, is it really fair to existing operators that, for example, if, if your satellite only is, is uh, designed to only live for 48 hours, is it fair to other operators to, to, uh, that you still stay up there 25 years? So I think while they were very successful, it's also time to revisit the orbital debris mitigation guidelines and continue that story where uh, a nation can stand up and show leadership and show the rest of the world how we think uh, it should be done and then have an international discussion and come to sort of a, a, a consensus. But somebody needs to start. So Doug, question for you. Um, there's a couple questions here asking about you know, is basically is commercial SSA data really up to the task? And so, you know, do you think, you know, where, you talked about a little bit, can you expand, you know, what what is it the commercial SSA community can do today? Where is capabilities going? And, and are those gonna be sufficient to deal with the problem? And in particular, uh, what, what Doug Libero mentioned, which is, you know, how do we get better at this job so we can not be overwhelmed by the false positives that are coming? Yeah. Okay. So, so I will be very careful. Um, uh, this is off script now, foot and mouth time for me. Uh, happens a lot. Um, okay. Number one is the commercial SSA data. And I'm going to speak for us, but I, I know there's other folks that um, achieve similar levels of, of performance uh, to what we achieve. The answer is yes. And I would just end it at that, but now I'll, I'll, I'll uh, say a little more. So there are customers that we have that are U.S. government customers that use our data to fly their satellites. There are commercial operators that use our data to fly their satellites. 
There are commercial operators that use our data to calibrate their sensors that they use to fly their satellites. So I would say the answer is yes, because today um, people are using our data. Um, so what are some of the attributes uh, of the data that we produce that makes that possible? Um, number one, uh, we did think outside the box and we just said, hey, we're, we're going to field telescopes around the world. You know, we've got a telescope in a barn in Kentucky. We've got it in a chicken coop in Adelaide. Um, anywhere we had a friend that had an interest in astronomy, it was easy to ship them a telescope or fly someone out there for a vacation and set up a little site. And, and, on, and you know, some of the sites are sitting in wheelbarrows. That's how they're moved around. And so it looks laughable, um, but 8 inches, 11 inches, 14 inches, it's the same inches, no matter if it's in a protected dome or in a chicken coop. Um, number two, um, you, ha you do have to be able to process your data in a way that you can prove to the person what is the, what is the quality of the data. So I'll just I'll throw it out there. We tell everybody um, the best that we do on the best nights, you know, with the best SNR targets is a single measurement, one sigma, about 30 meters. And you have to remove timing biases to, to get that down. Uh, I'll just say that's better than the state of the art today from the USG. So you know you can create better data out of commercial uh, off-the-shelf telescopes than uh, folks are with their trusted systems. Um, next gets into the what can you be counted on to deliver? Can you um, can your data be processed through their tools? Those are the big challenges, um, and that that's you know you just have to get through those hurdles. But if you get through those hurdles. Um, the main thing that the JSPOT catalog lacks is simply more data. Um, they have they have great data. They have uh, good orbits. You know, we've we spent years looking at the spacetrack.org catalog, uh, kind of you know thinking, oh look how great we are. We're going to do this one better. So of course, we would focus on one object, and then we would do better than the JSPOC. Great. Um, to create an entire catalog of 15,000 objects and have a quality of service that's better than the entire JSPOC catalog is another thing altogether. They have SPSS, they have geods, they have radars, and if you pick, let's say you pick one customer, hey, you have five satellites. I'm gonna do I'm gonna build my whole company around just looking at your satellites. You will do better than the J Spot for that customer because that customer may maneuver twice a day, they may maneuver once a week. Um, but the J Spot doesn't care about Intel Sat, you know, twenty five or whatever. They, you know, they're not worried about that. But Intel Sat does want to know where that satellite is as precisely as possible. Um, we got a few minutes left. Trying a couple of couple of the good ones. So there's a couple of questions here that get to this broader question of, you know, ultimately there needs to be some level of enforcement. If you're going to say, you know, hey, we're going to have these rules. We want people to behave well. We don't want people to screw up orbit. Uh, how does that? How might that look? So I assume that will be right right to the regulator. <laughs> Um, so enforcement. So this one comes up a number of times. Be because we are the FAA and you, most of you arrived here safely via aviation, enforcement is good. It works in, in many places in many ways. But when we start talking space, this is where we really have to divorce ourselves from the rest of our FAA brethren and, and try to pull away from the air piece because people think that we're going to have some traffic controller saying um, you need to pull left 30 degrees right now. And that's not how space works. And so um, enforcement starts off, as we've mentioned here, with norms and best practices. Long before we even get to regulations, we have to know what are acceptable. That, that's really what we have to do. You have to do an, an economic evaluation of your regulation. If you can say this is the standard practice that's already happening, that really assists in getting your regulations through. So say you, you make your regulation for space, and now you have a space traffic regulation. Not all of it is on orbit regulation, a lot of it is design regulation, pre-launch regulation, what is a safe vehicle, how do you design a space vehicle that's safety, and so those are regulations for space traffic. But now we start talking about operational regulation, and this is where the enforcement question comes in. Now, the, the best kind of regulation and enforcement ideas are regulations that the person, they know what the standard is and they know how to comply with it. And so for conjunction specifically, I'll give you an example, say, uh, 
one in 10,000 or for one in 5,000 in eight hours. Okay, so that's a standard that we give that says you must take some mitigation action, and this is purely hypothetical, by this time frame. It, it wouldn't be, I don't think it would be possible for you to give the type of direction we do for aviation to a commercial space operator or any space operator. Everyone is different, everyone is unique. That's why we do rockets differently. They're all different. Even though they look the same, it may be the same appearing rocket, they're all different. Um, and this is the same thing with space operators. They are all different. They all have different capabilities and different things. So, so that enforcement would be, you must take some mitigation effort. And that mitigation could be maneuver, could be tell someone else to maneuver, could be minimize your cross-sectional area if you don't have maneuver capability, could be don't do uploads or data downloads during that time frame. It could be monitor before and monitor after. All ki kinds of different activities that you could do. So, but the final part of that, uh, that is the enforcement, is what happens if they don't comply. And what we find from the industry that we regulate is that we don't often get there. So really, enforcement isn't something where we have to do the fine piece. They want to comply once they know the rules. So enforcement isn't about that. Now, we always have the hammer um, in the back drawer, um, but we never have to take it out. Because if you create um, responsible and uh, clear regulation, they know what they're supposed to do. And so that's, that's kind of my answer to the enforcement part. And Milan, do you think that that sort of regime would sit well with most of the operators? Absolutely. Well, I think most of the, um, you know, I think people who want to do nefarious stuff are going to do nefarious stuff. And um, you, I think that the, the key in that regard, you just need to be able to call them out. And and if and I think and, and until at least norms are set to where they're and they're probably international norms are set. Um, even calling them out doesn't do any good because they say I'm not violating anything. I'm not even violating a norm. So I, I think Steph's right. Yeah, it's, it does start with uh, uh, norms of behavior, and and when people understand the norms, the, in, a, in the best world, and this happens with the FCC, is people self-report. <laughs> they they know what the, they know what the rules are, and when they violate the rules, the FCC has no ability to track violators. Really, a very small ability. But most people will self-report, and that's when you know you've you've written a good uh, you've got a good regulatory regulatory environment is when people are actually self-report. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I think Earl's right. You start with norms. Uh, Earl's right. You start with norms, and you and you go from there. And then everyone understands the norms. And when someone violates the norms, they're the ones who are calling the the, uh, the bad operators out. All right. Well, um, like join me in thanking our panelists uh, for the discussion. I think we're heading to a coffee break. <laughs> <laughs>